from tribe and hospitality who have a wealth of experience contacts knowledge all of which they're going to impart with us today no pressure Hey, Claire. Well, well, welcome on and all those that we know, those that we don't know. Um, right. The, the title we chose today is What Have Sales Ever Done For Us? So uh, it's not original. It's very much stolen, lifted, depending on who's suing you, from the famous line from the brilliant Monty Python film, The Life of Brian. Now, they asked, actually asked what the Romans had ever done for them. And one of the subjects under occupation asked, uh, what have the Romans ever done for us? He then smugly sits down not expecting any answers, as he wrongly believed that there was no actual positives to the situation. Nobody, nobody thought the, the Romans had done anything for them. However, over the next couple of minutes, the crowd began to shout out a multitude of real benefits, including the food, the wine, safety at night, roads, refuse collection, and so on and so on. The point being that many people who've not worked in sales and maybe just in operations, many of us have been through both uh, operations and sales, think that uh, salespeople just sit around, make the odd phone call and drink coffee. Well, that's not true because I drink tea. But oh dear. yeah, <laughs> not during the day. But uh, obviously we're very much still in the middle of the COVID situation, which has been pretty dreadful for, for everybody. Um, we've all been in various recessions over the years and also many downturns, but the current situation to uh, use the, the current common term is, is, is very unprecedented to use one uh, cliche that um, so as the economy hopefully picks up in the future or even during these early days when the, the roadmap from Boris is, is, is released the need to get business into our business is absolutely paramount and we all know that some of our regular clients will return hopefully but some won't so there will be many old contacts that we can renew, but unfortunately, as we all know, there will be quite a few people not actually working in these uh, corporates, agents, uh, businesses anymore, unfortunately. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative, as we all realise, the need to increase the pipeline of business and work on new contacts. And it's, it's probably more important than it ever has been, to be honest, certainly in our business. So how do we do this? Well, it's easy by saying, well, being proactive with ourselves. Well, well what is proactivity? Well, We'll obviously mention that in the course of the next 10-15 minutes. But venues need to be out there physically whenever possible, meeting clients and agents and also looking at how they can bring in new sources of business from maybe untapped markets. So if we need a fully functioning, well-trained sales team, why are so many salespeople being let go by venues? I'm sure you've seen LinkedIn, some fantastic people are looking for work have been lost. Or maybe we know the reasons because there's been no cash flow, there's been no money coming in. But who's, who's going to be out there getting in touch with, with the contacts from corporates, from agencies, if these sales teams have been disbanded there's nobody there? What have salespeople ever done for us? If there's nobody out there working on your behalf as a venue, you'll soon find out. Your venue might be COVID ready, absolutely safe, but ultimately pretty empty. Anyway, Kevin, would you like to pick up from there? Absolutely. And uh, we know the dreaded date last year in March where everything disappeared down the toilet uh, for many of our businesses. Uh, but, but let's look back to what, um, what the business was worth to, to the economy. And this has been pulled together from various publications, conference news and comments from our associations, the HBAA, MIA, et cetera, et cetera. But the, 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 the values of our business, of, of our industry has gone from anything from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion to 85 billion. But I think what we need to bear in mind is that we're such a disparate type of industry. We've got venues, you know, we've got agents, we've got events, and we've got all of the infrastructure behind that. So security, show force who are building sets and whatever, caterers, wedding venues, wedding caterers, et cetera, et cetera. How many people did it employ in the UK before it all went south? Uh, Martin's already alluded to the fact that quite a few of our colleagues and friends are no longer in, in roles that they were. Uh, but it, it sort of varies from half a million up to 750,000 people, dependent on what you're, where you're looking at it from. Uh, but I did read somewhere this week that there is it is thought that a third of the population has some involvement or had some involvement in the hospitality industry before the, the pandemic took hold. And that's going down right the way down to 
people who do part-time in bars and part-time restaurant shifts, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the plan going forward? How do we future-proof our industry? I think basically we need to look at our, our um, the way we work. We have to look at our teams. We have to make sure our teams are lean, hungry, and ready to, to move forward. But more of that as we go on. So back to you, Martin. Thanks, Kev. Yeah, onwards and upwards. Well, you know, the unfortunate situation, because of we all know from Boris and the government uh, and their reluctance to let hospitality get cracking, even though I think it was 3% of cases apparently were, were related to the hospitality industry for COVID, which is incredibly small. So some venues are still closed and they have been for a year. So it's, it's very easy for venues to sort of fall off the radar. You know, so people will have forgotten the venue. So it's our job in sales to get out there and remind people that the venues, even though they're physically closed, they're actually open for business. So please make inquiries, phone, uh, send emails. I mean, Claire's had a, a with um, Venue Queen, noticed inquiries have started to come through. Lots of the agents we deal with have said, you know, it's gone mad this week or also last week. So be prepared to reply to, to uh, agents on behalf of their corporates. Because if you're not open, they'll go somewhere else. Just make a response, even if it's within 24 hours. So that makes a difference. Looking at the short term, I mean, we've got the rest of this spring and summertime. Uh, again, with Borrow My Garden, lots of clients are looking at doing stuff outside because by the very nature, it's probably healthier than being inside, even with their circulation and windows and all that kind of thing. So short term, what can we do? It's thinking out the box. Well, we've always done this in these meeting rooms. We've never opened our gardens. There's lots of venues now utilising gardens for, for various different business activities, as, as Carol will know extremely well with, with her company. So... So look at the short term, but obviously next year, and a lot of venues are saying, well, we're busy because so much of the business has been put, put back until 2022, but there's no inquiries coming in for 2023. So, so what can we actually do? So it's very much a case of it's half glass full, not we don't even have a glass to, to take a drink out of. So it's, it's trying to be positive. It, it is tough, but you've got to think positively. What can we do? How can we do that? Communicate with buyers, communicate with agents. And really, you know, let's move forward. So what does this future look like? Well, Kev's going to tell us, unless it gets cut off. <laughs> By the co-host. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's that blue supporter, John, you know. Anyway, <laughs> moving forward, the, the, whole, the whole landscape of the meetings and events industry has changed. Uh, and within a business, you know, you need to know exactly what you have to sell. It's not going to be a case of you can sell uh, X number of meeting rooms and you can have uh, that room for a syndicate room, that for a meeting room, that for a, an auditorium, because it's everything's going to be different. You know, um, what's your online, you know, your online presence, that's your shop window. So your online presence, you need to make sure that it's up to date. One of the one of the criticisms that we've heard quite a lot of late is that with a lot of venues, they have they paid an absolute fortune to be on the likes of venue directory. They paid a fortune to be on search for venues and all that sort of thing. But actually, all they've done is regurgitated their brochure, which they had printed three years ago. So a meeting room that looks now to say, take 500 people, actually with social distancing, et cetera, can only take 150 people. You need to be honest upfront and make people aware of what you've got. Not mine. Other medication. The other thing that you need to do as far as your, your venue is concerned is look at what you do have to offer and are you on the right platforms? The likes of, um, you know, we work with Maddingley Hall in Cambridge, which has got a huge amount of um, outdoor space and gardens, which traditionally they haven't used in the past, but now they're using them. And they've signed up to Borrow My Garden, which is a platform that, is aimed purely and simply at people that are looking for outdoor spaces for meetings and events. If your venue is a bit left field, a bit odd, unique, however you want to describe it, then perhaps you should be looking to talk to Dan at uh, Prestige Events and their cool venue um, directory. There's all sorts of things that you need to be considering. Hybrid events. Uh, we've all heard a lot about hybrid events and there's been a a, a lack of understanding and in some cases I think um, <clears throat> a, 
people have been unwilling to 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 get to grips with it but the long and the short of it is that as we start coming out of this and people start saying well you can only have meetings for 15 20 30 whatever the the uh, the restrictions are hybrid events will work the other thing with hybrid events is it works towards sustainability do you really want 400 people on a train making their way down to london in close proximity when you could have 20 people in london 50 people in Birmingham and all linked in by the new platforms. But it's this stage that you need to start looking at collaborations and working with organizations that can have, offer a platform. But you also need to understand those platforms so that you can communicate that to the likes of your agents, your, your existing client base. As I may, mentioned before, the whole landscape of the meetings and events industry is, has changed. We need to look at, uh, we're gonna get new buyers now. New buyers will have different uh, priorities. Um, so they'll be looking at things, things that weren't perhaps as important, but things that we've started to recognize during the last 12 to 18 months is the importance of sustainability, looking after the planet. Um, if you have within your, within your business, you have, strong sustainable policies and procedures how are you making the market aware of that you know and it comes back to what i'm saying about online uh, platforms you need to talk to people like green gauge who funnily enough andrew is following on from martin and myself and i'm sure he will tell you how he can support businesses that are um, sustainable and working towards sustainability if you see that as a key key elements of your business going forward, then perhaps you should talk to Green Gauge because they can support you in making sure that you're working towards carbon neutral, that you're doing little, um, nothing going through to landfill, all of this sort of thing. But the other thing that's important is mental health and well-being. And the new buyers will be looking at what you can offer from that perspective. Um, we were talking to one venue recently that um, they, as a result of talking to a buyer, they've now set up what they call a reset and reboot room. And basically, if an organiser feels that a member of the, the audience that they're working with or, or one of their delegates is needing some time because they're getting basically uh, upset and can't cope with this new this new experience of meeting with lots of other people, then they can go off to this room, they can relax, they can reboot, they can think about things and then come back. It's all of these things are now quite important with the buyers that are coming through. And you need to look at new markets as well. And we've spoken about outdoor, outdoor spaces, unique venues, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, it's all about collaboration and getting involved and yep, from here on in, I'm going to hand you back to my partner in crime, Martin. Thanks, Kev. Yeah, it, it's very much about collaborations. It's a, it's a whole new world, literally, with who we're dealing with. And, you know, the business isn't going to come rolling in necessarily as it did before. Uh, Kevin and I met in 1990 at Peter Rand, which was the first ever conference agency going back, you know, just after the war, which was a long time ago. So the importance of third parties, a lot of venues have said to us, well, we don't want to pay commission because we get the, the business directly. Well, that's fine. But I think moving forward, we've got to be very aggressive in, in getting business. And we're certainly in contact with hundreds and hundreds of different agencies. Some have struggled, some might not come back in quite the same form, the same numbers, but they're extremely important. A lot of venues say to us, well, we just want to get straight to the corporates, you know, the top, top 100 companies, et cetera. Well, A, it's got to be the right kind of business for your venue. And B, it's got to obviously make some money. So the thing is with agents, they've, they've been hit very hard and they're now opening up again, getting inquiries, but they're hungry. And the thing is they've worked extremely hard to develop clients. And whereas you might get into one, maybe two, if you're speaking to an agency, you might be getting into 10, 50, 100 potential uh, corporate buyers for your specific venue. So it's all about trying to work smart and you know, making, making some quick wins. So I think with, with agents, it's, it's a no-brainer, really. And, and Kev and I, if, if the agents don't know Kev, they're, they're hardly not worth knowing because he knows everybody backwards. Yeah, at all. So, <laughs> so with the agents, it's extremely important. It's working together. It's communicating and being an adult about commission paid and the best rates. 
agents don't always want to screw you down for the lowest rate because then it lowers commission. It's always about it's about value for money, very much so. That hopefully they will return and it's 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 you know selling your venue in the best the best light. Uh, so so really the thing is it's working together. Who can you work with? Who can you trust? And moving forward in a slightly different way, and also utilizing experts, uh, which I think Kev, you're going to yeah talk about. The other thing that. Um, it, has uh, become apparent is that a lot of businesses now are leaner. They don't have the uh, the resources that they had perhaps 12 months, 18 months ago because of uh, COVID and making people redundant, furlough, et cetera, et cetera, which in turn means that they, their pot to recruit experts in sales or experts in marketing or experts in social media and AV, they're just not there. So what we would say, we've, we've mentioned collaboration already, but there are a number of organization, organizations out there that you can buy rather than paying a, a huge amount, and we're all worth it, for experienced salespeople, go to organizations, may I add, like Trident, that can help you get in front of agents, go to organize, marketing organizations like Borrow My Garden that can put you in front of people who are buying uh, sort of outdoor spaces and go to and rather than investing and taking people into your team on a full-time basis work with organizations like us absolutely we're very oh, nice goodness. really the jokes oh, are we're, good but we're, we're, we're all we're, we're, we're lovely <laughs> so in conclusion are things out of control out of our control absolutely not our future is down to us, not to anyone else. It, you can't sit on your backside and think, oh, it'll all come back in at some stage. It won't. You have to be pragmatic. You have to look at new approaches. You have to be flexible and fluid. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always had, I think is the same. But to move forward, rebuild your business, you have to be flexible. You have to look at what you can do. And if somebody says, can you do this? And in the past, you can say, oh, no, don't do that. Uh, then you're not going to get anywhere. A point in case is one of our venue partners. If you'd have spoken to them 18 months ago, they would only do training courses and they would only do small corporate businesses. But as a result of COVID, they've been selling outdoor spaces. They've never, in 50 years of being in business, they've never ever done a wedding. For the next two years, they've got 80 confirmed weddings on the books. And that, how does that help them? People pay a deposit, they've got money coming in and they can survive. And it means that they can keep the team on, keep us on, ha. And, and you know, it's that, it's adapt or die, or as the government keeps saying, pivot and prosper, which is really quite difficult to say when you've had a strong cup of tea. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it from Martin and myself. And uh, there you are. You might be a pawn now, but work hard work with collaborate work with people and you'll end up a king uh, and i'm shortly going to hand you over to our colleague andrew from green gauge solutions we've been working quite closely with andrew uh, on sustainability and i think we all have a moral obligation both personally and from a business perspective to seriously consider the impact that we have not just on the environment but also on people that work for us from so with mental health and well-being and also for the local community and on that note i'm before, going to stop sharing my screen and hand you go, over yeah oh. before we go to andrew has have people got any questions for um, for a couple of old folks like us you know what what we could do to help what's happening thoughts or if you've got any input you know obviously we're learning all the time we we certainly pretend but we don't know everything and mm. this is a bit of an unknown future so you know it's as we said it's collaboration working with people and new ideas can be the, the way forward you know you know I, I, you know one of the one of the organizations that we work with is um is carol at uh, forest of hearts and that you, you know that that's a way of working with the you know getting corporates to do something for a community whether it's their own community or working with a community uh, like carol does in in warwickshire and and around stratford but i'm sure if anyone's interested in forest of hearts if you get in touch with martin myself or or, 
or Claire, then we can get the information across to you. Sorry, I think I just saw a question from uh, come up there. Oh, thank you, Julian. <laughs> I don't think they're questions. I think everyone's just endorsing the two of you. I know. Lovely. <laughs> I could put one quick question in, if that's all right. Just ever. I know more time, Julian. It's going to be too complicated. <laughs> and and thank you. And mute. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me that gets muted and taken off. <laughs> Look, it, it was it was only just about whether whether the view is whether there's a view on agents and commissions and whether whether agents whether agents might take a view on commissions at the moment in in order to try and help or whether perhaps reasonably from their side, they're saying, look, we suffered as well. So, mm. so you know, from the agency perspective, those commission rates that we had are relevant and we need to charge them. And I could see an argument both ways. I just wondered if, if there was a feel on that. Um, shall I take that, Martin? Come on, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's interesting that um, just prior to the pandemic, I think it was Hilton was saying that they were going to stop paying commission to agents in the US. And then Marriott said that they were going on, they were going to do the same. Uh, and it was all of the, the, the American based groups that were going that route. Um, but then, but, but that's all sort of, but that's raised its head in the past. And I think Andrew probably knows better than I do that some of the, um, some of the airlines were trying to cut that, cut their commissions quite a lot in the nineties, early two thousands. Uh, but, Moving forward, I think it's all about working together with agents. And if you collaborate to get the right solution for the agent's clients, it works wonders. And the only way I, I think commission going forward has got has got to be the route. If if they're offering a free service, and I know some ag some agents do charge, but I think if if we can support the agent, if venues can support the agents by paying them commission then they will support the venues. One of the things that has come out of the, um, the, the pandemic from people that we've spoken to is that the agents are very keen to work alongside venues because they need those venues for their clients. And if they, if, if, if they start to hack us off or we start to hack them off, then we don't get the business. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the customer that's, that, um, that suffers in the end. So yes, I think commission will continue. And I think, it's all down to collaboration. Claire's sitting there nodding her head. I suppose from an agent's perspective, we ought to ask your, your view, Claire. Yeah, and you know, it's really helpful having a venue background as well. And I have always taken the position that 10% of something is better than 0% of nothing. Therefore, mm. it's a no brainer. Mm. Absolute well, no brainer. Yeah. So it's ultimately a cost of sale as well, isn't it? If, if you rely mm. on agencies, well, then they they're getting in front of, as we said, 50, 100 corporates for you. And if, again, it comes down to communication and talking to someone and explaining, this is what you've got, and it might not be suitable for that particular inquiry. Nobody likes to say no, but ultimately, long term, if you're giving out correct information and liaising and communicating properly, then that agent will trust you and come back and say, well, this one we really think would work, or mm. you know, you looked after us last time. It's it's about it's about you know getting people in and, and trusting them and trying again mm. trying trying to have that business conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we sorry, I, I'm not trying to cut you short, but I know that uh, Andrew is ready and waiting. And but, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your affordable sales team has a uh, YouTube, as does Trident has a YouTube. And moving forward, a lot of people, like from a Trident perspective, we are hoping to have uh, interviews with agents to get their perspective. So please keep an eye out for that. We're also talking to the venues and interviewing the venues. Andrew is going to be interviewed so we can talk about sustainability in the meetings and events industry. That's my plug. I'm handing you back now to, uh, to, to Andrew to talk about the Green Revolution. Okay. Am I live? <laughs> You're live, Houston. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much to Kevin and Martin for um, a great session. Uh, you're a, br a brilliant warm-up act, um, <laughs> but, but uh, more than that, you're a, a, a great support in the industry, and um, certainly at Green Gage, we really appreciate that, and you really get sustainability and the fact that it's something we need to do to help the planet, but also it's a business opportunity at the same time. So. Uh, today, really pleased to join the webinar. 
Um, I'm doing a few of these at the moment. I did yesterday, I thought I'd, I'd share with you, I did a webinar yesterday uh, and my audience was primary school head teachers. So about five minutes, I'm just getting into my stride of my presentation uh, and a lady's face popped up onto the screen. She just joined a bit flustered and she said, um, I'm really sorry I'm late, but I, I've been dressed as a banana and I had trouble getting out of the costume. So I just wanted to say this morning, if you are dressed as an item of fruit, um, please don't be embarrassed. It's absolutely fine. So my topic this morning um, is uh, the Green Revolution. I'm going to talk a bit about um, how far along the path we are to combating climate change, uh, what it means for business. So I suppose it's literally a bit of a, a temperature check. I don't know if anybody remembers the um, Flash Gordon movie. Um, and there's a, there's a great line in it. Flash, I love you, but we only have 14 hours to save the earth. Hopefully it's quite a good impression, I think. Um, well, this morning I only have 14 minutes to talk about saving the earth. And it's difficult to do justice to a big topic, but um, I'm going to give it a go anyway. And um, when I talk on this topic, inevitably, I talk about a lot of quite worrying trends. So uh, I can seem a bit doom laden. So I thought I would today turn it on its head and at least start by sharing a bit of progress and hope for the future. Um, and talking of hope, this is where I hope I can share my screen. <laughs> so it's the most difficult bit of any presentation. The thing is, I think, you know, the world has become very dependent on fossil fuels for, for generating energy. And, and that's anything from fueling a car or a power station. And there's a huge problem, of course, because we want to reduce carbon emissions. So the big coal-fired power stations, so for a long time, they've been amongst the worst sources of pollution in, in the world, but with huge amounts of CO2, sulfur dioxide being going up into the atmosphere. Um, and they're coal, they've been coal fired. And we all probably remember, do you remember the miners strike? And you know, when there was a strike, mm. uh, we had power cuts <laughs> because the coal ran out. But actually in the last few years, we've had a bit of a silent revolution. Um, and now, Kevin, yes. what can you yes. see now? <laughs> I can see uh, a cow with wind turbines <laughs> growing out of its ear. This is, this is going to plan now, thank you. <laughs> So um, actually what's happened now is coal is virtually no uh, part in um, power generation. We've probably seen those chim chimneys, you know, being blown up um, all over the place, all around the country. <clears throat> and actually wind energy now represents about 25% of the total in the UK, which is amazing. I just think today looking out the window is probably a bit more than that. <clears throat> but the plan is to go a lot further with carbon free power generation. So by 2030, we've got much cheaper, um, cleaner energy. So here's a fascinating fact. <clears throat> Did you know that enough solar energy reaches the Earth in one hour to cover the entire planet's energy needs for one year? Wow. And yet solar energy meets only one tenth of a percent of global energy demand. Um, so, you know, this is a huge potential, really. Renewable power is um, immense in its potential. And I think we're going to see a big increase in the development of solar. Um, and there's, there's some amazing projects around the world to, to make this happen. And the fact is, we've got a huge demand um, for electric energy, especially if we want to power electric cars, for example. So if we can tap into unlimited sources of energy, and it's really exciting and, and i think where there's human ingenuity there's hope um, we've mended the hole in the ozone layer we landed on the moon we created a covid vaccine but you know the clock is ticking and for years unfortunately we've neglected to really tackle the climate emergency so the effects of climate change which are caused by greenhouse gases are um, I think it's not overstating to say we, it's taking us to the edge of disaster and we're then adding to that by um, destroying our precious ecosystems as well. So 
right now we've got a bit of a narrow window of opportunity um, and beyond that we probably can't reverse the effects of climate change which would be horrendous so um, that would be really serious and ultimately a lot more serious probably than the current coronavirus pandemic so you know we've all seen haven't we on the tv the, the effects of climate change around the world and temperatures are now their highest rate um, since well over 800,000 years and there's a real close correlation between the rise in greenhouse gas emissions that are causing it if you ever want to know what a ton of co2 looks like well here's a bit of a representation and each year we're pumping 50 billion tons of it into the atmosphere and if you're looking for evidence of rising temperature here's a couple of examples um, last year 16th of august we saw the world's highest ever temperature 54.4 degrees celsius in death valley california same time of year siberia set a record for the highest temperature ever recorded in the arctic circle at 38 degrees now, six years ago, the, the Paris Climate Accord resulted in a pledge by 196 countries towards holding down global temperature rises to well below two degrees, and ideally not more than 1.5 degrees. Uh, the moment we're way off track, um, haven't really done a lot since then. Um, and on current trends, we, we certainly are likely to breach the 1.5 degrees. Um, and then probably go on to get to about three or four degrees warming. But it's kind of a difficult thing to kind of get in your head, isn't it? Well, three or four degrees doesn't really sound that much. So I thought this was quite an interesting map to, to demonstrate what it would look like if we were plus four degrees. Uh, and just the thing to focus on is green is where you can live um, and yellow is where you probably won't be able to live. So. If you fancy an apartment in Western Antarctica, well, that could be on its way. Now, this is this is my Professor Chris Whitty <laughs> slide. It is horrendous, isn't it? But and don't worry about this. Please just look on the left-hand side, and you can see that wiggly line going up, um, which shows CO2 emissions from 1980 rising, and then this massive drop from kind of about now when we have to do everything to then get CO2 emissions down to a level where we can get to carbon zero. And, and so it's a, it's a horrendous slide, but it just shows why we need to take action now. And we need to reduce by about 45% um, CO2 by the end of this decade. So it's a big, it's a big challenge, really. Um, and of course, apart from greenhouse gases, there are all kinds of other things we're doing to muck up our planet um so for example in in the time taken for this webinar um a size of an area of forest around about four and a half thousand soccer pitches down um and a large percentage of that deforestation is in south america um, where the amazon unfortunately has already shrunk by 17 percent it's a big problem because of course we need trees to capture air from uh, carbon from the air um, and as we were talking about right, right at the beginning when we were having a chat you know plastic is a real um, plague as well uh, whether it be uh, thrown away masks um, or bottles you know that's that's a, a real issue too so um, 2021 has to be a turning point uh, in tackling the climate crisis um, and there is potential for it to be that I'm hoping that um, by the time we get to the COP26 climate change conference, vaccines will have kicked in and we'll be talking more about climate than coronavirus. So this um, conference this, this year is probably our last chance to get a global consensus and commitment on firm actions that can reverse where we are at the moment. So I'd say nobody can delay action for another year whether it's business or just things we are doing personally we all make, need to make some quite big changes so some company names here um, companies are getting it and deciding they must do something and in recent months we've seen a, a lot of 
commitments from organisations like you can see here and AstraZeneca, for example, they've pledged to be carbon zero by 2025 and carbon negative by 2030, NHS um, carbon neutral by 2040. So I think this year we're going to see a lot of organisations focusing on their supply chain, making sure they're working with companies that have green credentials. Um, and you're going to see requests to quote and tenders, whatever business sector you are in, that they're increasingly going to have green um, hoops to jump through. Um, I have to say, by the way, universities are fantastic at this. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very well developed um, in terms of their approach to sustainability. Um, actually, I think companies are and other organisations um, are realising that acting sustainably can make them more successful, um, as well as contributing to a, a better planet. Uh, and talking of universities, because uh, I know we've um, we've got Alexis up, up on today. You know, there's a lot of pressure, peer pressure, isn't there, from your customers, students, that they they have they're demanding this now. So, um, carbon efficient organizations do outperform others and create better shareholder returns. CDP is the global disclosure system for organizations um, to manage environmental impact. Uh, and they found that companies who cut emissions increased revenue whilst at the same time reducing costs. There's a real, so there's a real kind of commercial benefit there. So all of this stuff I'm, I've been talking about, you know, is why I set up Green Gage, and I've been in um, the travel meeting sector for uh, many years. And I realised that as a sector, we're actually contributing to the problem, um, whether that's CO2 emissions from flights or food waste from hotel restaurants. And yet, uh, as an industry and other public and private sectors also have the levers to make a real positive a difference and lead the way to others. So um, at Green Gage, what we do is we work with a, a diverse set of companies, all of whom want practical advice on how to be greener. Uh, and it's a lot would be saying, uh, where do I start? Um, and others, they just kind of want a helping hand on the on the journey. And that's that's what we are um, here for. I think the important thing for us all to recognize is that being sustainable can be a really positive thing. And it's okay to make money and do good at the same time. So our aim um, at Green Gage is really to assist clients in helping preserve the planet, but at the same time using sustainability as a competitive edge um, and also as a way of um, saving costs as well. So I'd say for any business wanting to be sustainable, um, this is our checklist of what you should be aiming for. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, of course, can help with these, these things. Um, and I, just focusing on one or two of these. So in terms of regulation, we will see a lot more regulation coming into the market. <clears throat> Many companies already have to report their greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I predict the net is going to widen with smaller and smaller companies being required to, to report it um, as well. Talking about client expectations, I would say that even if your business isn't that interested in sustainability, the chances are your customers or clients will be. Um, whether it's business to business, business to consumer, um, I'm old enough to remember persuading my parents to buy a particular cereal because there was a little plastic toy in there. That was my influence. Now it's probably slightly different. We've now got children um, highly informed who are influencing the choice of car and saying we you ought to have electric. Um, in terms of reputation, you know, some organizations are really boosting their brands by embracing sustainability and as a core value. And I'm thinking here, uh, IKEA, Innocent Drink, Neil's Yards, they do it really well. Um, and interestingly, in, in, because we do um, a lot of accreditation work with hotels and, and, um, ho and venues, we've continually asked for purchasing recommendations um, on anything from uh, renewable electricity, for example, to um, beer. 
So, so what we've been doing is we've, we've been creating a directory of products from ethical companies who offer sustainable products um, and services. So we've we found some brilliant organisations like um, Good Energy, uh, who do sustainable um, gas and electricity, Cheeky Panda, um, amazing company who um, use bamboo to make um, paper products, uh, and my favourite, Toast Beer, who create beer out of um, using uh, bread crusts, fabulous. And well, in each of these cases, a greener approach is giving them a competitive edge. And I think at the same time, being green and reducing your carbon footprint often um, gives you some cost savings as well, particularly lots of things to do with um, energy. If you promote a culture that engages and retains staff, um, a lot of research shows that you will um, keep hold of your staff and actually actively attract new ones and, and that job seekers are targeting companies that they perceive as acting sustainably. Um, and when we talk to companies and suggest, you know, like a green action committee, there's never any um, shortage of people volunteering for that. And also, I think um, having a sustainable approach, it, it doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's really an ongoing process. So it's a great way of, of demonstrating a continuous improvement. Um, and of course, everything you do in this area is very good to support any um, CSR strategy. Now, here's another checklist, and I'm not going through it, so don't worry about that. Um, but I'm happy to circulate this. It's, it's, I think it's just good to have a planned approach. Um, and also think right at the start, what is it you want to achieve? Like, um, it could be like AstraZeneca, you want a firm carbon commitment, um, or something much simpler than that. And if I focus just for a moment on accommodation and meetings, because we do a lot in this area, um, I think hotels and venues, they're going to be expected to demonstrate clear, sustainable credentials. And there's an increasing evidence that travellers see this as a really significant factor in, in choosing a hotel. So um, it's the same for meeting organisers as well, who spend much more time now on due diligence and, and pick places that um, can demonstrate eco-credentials. So right now, hotels who do sustainability well are at a real um, competitive advantage. <clears throat> so what we did last year is we created EcoSmart um, accreditation, really to, to recognise um, and help hotels and venues that are doing their bit for the planet. Um, we, we positioned it for the uh, business traveller meetings market. <clears throat> and, and the thing is, you know, official accreditation really can add credibility to any sustainability initiatives and, and helps identify any gaps as well, so you can make improvements. Um, we do this with a, it's a simple audit of um, operational aspects. You can see what they are on, on the, the left-hand side. And um, so venues that have gone through this, they get um, certification from bronze to platinum. A lot of the Trident venues, most of them actually are, have been accredited. But we didn't want it to be just kind of like a little badge that gets slapped on. We wanted it to be uh, more of an ecosystem dedicated to supporting hotels through the sustainability journey and, and finding ways to actively turn um, that advantage into business. So we've got a, a nationwide network now and it incorporates everything really from hotels, venues, universities, um, or even, you know, a patch of ground, which is fantastic for holding an outdoor event, you know, we could we can include that as well. So um, we think we'll probably be at several hundred properties by the end of the year. And if, if you want to have a look, just just have a look on our website, we've got our online directory there. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now and really just say that um, at Green Gauge, our mission isn't really about changing the world. We don't think that's going to happen from our efforts. But we do want to try and help deliver lots of small changes that could add up to making a real difference. So um, I hope you found this session useful. Um, and of course, if you've got any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like a copy of um, anything you've seen this morning, do let, do let me know and you can visit our website for, for more information. 
So I think that's um, that's my last slide. Hopefully you, you did see those. <laughs> um, and if there's anything you want to, any comments or questions, of course, I'm very happy to, to talk about that. I realize we've only got five minutes, but um, back back over to, to um, everybody else. Um, I, I've got a comment to make, and as you know, Andrew, I'm, and Martin, as I keep ramming it down Martin's throat, I, I'm, I'm very much for and wanting to support sustainability in, in our venues, and, and I think as an industry as a whole, um, hospitality and the meetings and events industry. W one of my biggest frustrations is when you go walking down the park and there's like rubbish that's being chucked here, there and everywhere, I, which... And I think if the um, hospitality meetings and events industry can be seen to be taking the fore as far as sustainability is concerned, then hopefully by osmosis that will work through to the little scrotes who chuck their rubbish on the floor. Did I just say that? <laughs> but, but, yeah. But, but I, I think we really can. Um, we, I, I really think that as an industry, we can, we can help create a bit of a sea change um with joe soap on the on the on the street you know someone who perhaps has got a little one who's interested but really couldn't be asked himself uh i think by going to visit our venues going to visit our hotels stay in our hotels if the message is there and the message is clear then hopefully that will work back to to the customers that then will work back into the local community yeah yeah i think so i think it's a really good point kevin and uh you know, I guess a lot of the people who are on the street are also visiting hotels, going to, to mm. conferences uh, and so on. Uh, and what we're finding is that a lot of, when it comes to events now, um, there's much more likely to be a green flavor mm. to them. Um, companies just want, want that now because, because it's kind of for them a, a window on, a shop window, isn't it? Uh, and there's an expectation both internal and external mm. to um uh, for it to reflect the brand in a nice in a good way mm. and yesterday you know i mentioned i was uh, on this webinar with um head teachers um and this is because you know this type of message i'm talking about today it's this is it's so important as part of education isn't it to make mm. sure this this yeah. comes across and and um we did a webinar last week and one of the one of the people uh, on there they watched a recording of it um and their seven-year-old daughter was also um watched it with them um and they after that um said mum this is we've got to do something about the climate went off with a paper and pen and drew, drew this amazing poster and i just love the fact that you know a presentation like this which is fairly fairly technical it was similar to this but the seven-year-old got that thought we've got to do something about this so it doesn't matter what age people are whether it's a seven-year-old or a david attenborough everybody's kind of um, in this and has a part to play so we, we're trying to do a bit on the education side because you're quite right we just need to get the message out and as an industry we kind of you know have some bit of thought leadership yeah, I noticed that Dan's made quite a, a, a good comment. Dan, do you want do you want to um, voice it? Dan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I was just thinking with the Chancellor's announcement on CapEx, um, is this the time for venues to invest in tech for hybrid events so that we can lower the carbon footprint of events? Yeah, I think that sounds... Uh, OK. Did you hear that, Andrew? I didn't. I've, I've suddenly got a message saying <clears throat> unstable internet network. So oh, right. <laughs> apologies for that. I didn't. I didn't hear the, the question. Sorry or the comment. Uh, Dan was saying that I'll just find his comment, so I'll read it. With the Chancellor's announcement on capex, is this the perfect time for venues to invest in tech for hybrid events uh, to as part of the lowering of their carbon footprint um, of, of events taking place in that particular venue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a, it is such a good point that, and I think whilst we all want to get back to some the normality of actually meeting people, um, I think hybrid events is gonna be 
really critical to, to the success of um, uh, uh, meetings and events in the, in the next year or so. Um, and of course, you know, I think there's going to be a lot fewer people holding events abroad. You know, it's just not going to really be quite the right thing <laughs> anymore. So hybrid events is the, the brilliant way of actually still making um, uh, a conference or an event global, but with uh, an amazingly lower um, carbon footprint. So uh, I think I think Dan's absolutely right that now is the time to, to be investing in that mm. uh, technology because this is this is going to remain as the future. Super. It's eleven o'clock, and we appreciate that uh, time's not on not on our side. Uh, but Claire, thank you. Do you want to do the wrap up? Yes, I do. Thank you, Thanks, so Andrew. Much. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we will send a um, a link out just to put a link through to our YouTube channel so that you can catch up on any of this. If anybody's got any uh, other burning questions, we can put you in touch with any of the speakers. Um, and we will be back in two weeks time with um, Sarah Thompson from Octopus um, and she specializes in revenue management um, and Rachel Halling from Halling Consultancy, who is a very experienced spa manager and was the principal at Shantley's College. Um, so that should be interesting so that we try and encompass all parts of hospitality businesses. Um, so thank you very much for coming, everybody, and we hope to see you in two weeks time. Thank you. Brilliant. Keep safe, everyone. Yep. Thanks very much. And keep your car carbon down. <laughs>